Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. It's a, it's a strange thing having the camp, having camp during this week. It's it's weird seeing the pews so empty, um, but it's good to see all of you. And yes, as you probably heard, the eldership has asked for for me to begin a series with you all, and I figured I'd talk about everyday Christianity because it, it seems it seems we we can easily say, yes, I'm a Christian, but throughout our daily lives, just exactly how are we living that out, right? And examination is a big part of it. And so through this series, hopefully we all, uh, we all can continue to examine ourselves. We'll talk about everyday Christianity. Today we're going to talk about the timelessness of God and the timelessness of sin. And though it seems kind of strange to think about sin being timeless, uh, here's what I mean. So, in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. These words bring a sense of reassurance and hope, knowing that God has already triumphed over the world's struggles. I've been reading this book called Life in a Medieval Village. And it's interesting because this village, this village of Elton in England that I've been reading about, they have the same problems. This is a, this is a town from almost a thousand years ago. And from all the documents that have been collected, here's something the authors have spoken from this book. It says, the modern village is a place where its inhabitants live but not necessarily or even probably where they work. The medieval village, in contrast, was the primary community to which its people belonged for all life's purposes. There they lived, there they labored, there they socialized, loved, married, brewed and drank ale, sinned, went to church, paid fines, had children in and out of wedlock, borrowed and lent money, tools and grain, quarreled and fought and got sick and died. Together they formed an integrated whole. And the authors are speaking of the same struggles we have today, aren't they? It's almost comforting to know that these challenges to us today are not unique to us, but have been a part of the human experience. But in a sense, again, it's almost comforting. There's this sort of timelessness to sin, these timeless struggles we still have today that pierces the lives of everyone on earth, and it reveals, to me anyway, the timelessness of God and what he has ordained from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you continue to read in Genesis in Genesis, all the way through chapter 3, out of all of the flora and fauna, three things had been set apart. You have the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and man. These are the three things that were set apart of all creation. And God not only ordained what is good and what is evil, God, not man, but he allowed this knowledge, this knowledge, just the knowledge of good and evil, to manifest itself in the form of a tree. And it isn't just an expression of his sovereignty. He's showing Adam that he is the one. God is the one who made that distinction. From the very beginning, God is the one who has made the distinction of what is good and what is evil. What is good, what is bad. God made that distinction, and it was against his will to even, to even obtain that knowledge, to even eat of the fruit of that tree. And that was the first thing Adam and Eve were going to learn when they fed themselves from that tree. Isn't it? It's the first thing they were going to learn, that they had already disobeyed the will of God, that they had already sinned, just by, just by obtaining that knowledge. And when I think about it, I mean, what a blessing it must have been to not have that knowledge, right? Imagine yourselves in the position of Adam and Eve before they eat of this, this tree, before they eat of this fruit. Imagine a life without that burden, a life without our struggles, a life without our temptations that, that come with it, let alone the vile, disgusting things people experience from others, let alone our own decisions, the things we actually do 
and not just know what is. From the beginning, God didn't want that for us, and we've struggled ever since. And when we think of sin in this way, exploring the thoughts we just read from this book also, it reminds me of the first chapter of Ecclesiastes. And so if you don't mind, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 1. Because it does give us a really good idea of what the heady burden of even knowing good and evil is, let alone what kind of heavy burden we carry knowing anything at all. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting in verse 1, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. It reads as such, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What advantage does man have in all his work, which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place, it rises there again. Blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome, and man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it is new? Already it has, it has existed for ages which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things and also of the later things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. And it is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I realized that this also is striving after wind. Because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. His words in, here in Ecclesiastes are not just profound but absolutely true. All that has been will always be until Christ's return. And it's interesting here in verse 15 where he says, What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Because if there's one thing he, this writer did not know was Christ in his form as he came and died later. In fact, if we read in Luke chapter 3, verse 5, we can read a prophecy from Isaiah as it's spoken by John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain he will be brought low. Or every mountain will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough road smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. But that's not necessarily what the, the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying when he speaks what he says in verse 15. What he's speaking of is the futility of knowledge but even more so the futility of our actions under heaven. And it's interesting because worldly wisdom has this way of doing this. And as he says, it brings much grief, increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Oh, the depths of insights driven by the fruits of the knowledge of good and evil, yes? Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, this is, this is what the serpent says to, uh, to Eve. For God knows that in that day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What kind of insights really come from that? Well, first of all, the first thing they, were, they knew was the separation that was going to happen. And it happened. There's a separation from God, and that occurs from this sort of knowledge. 
And it's a separation that, again, God had been looking forward to not allowing man to experience. It's not as if God was saying, oh, yeah, you're going to eat from this tree. God's giving them a choice, and they had the choice, and they made it. And though we now have salvation in Jesus Christ, we can all look back and know why we need salvation in Christ. It isn't because of anything your parents ever did. It isn't because of anything anybody else has ever done. It's from your own decisions that you've made in life. You have fallen short of the glory of God, just as I have fallen short of the glory of God. And for what? This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes is asking. And for what? Why did we make the decisions we've made in our lives to separate ourselves from God? Why have we made the decisions? And even more so, as we continue forward knowing we're falling short, why do we continue to make decisions that we know is separating us from Christ? It's separating us from God. And as we move on to chapter 2, I do want to read further into it. It says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works, I built, my, I built houses for myself, I planted vineyards for myself, I made gardens and parks for myself and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold from my heart any pleasure. For my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. And thus, I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. Then I said to myself, as the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I, why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten. And how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which have, ha, had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And he continues on with what happens after we die. The wisdom of what's pleasurable is what he's saying, is what he's talking about. And what pleases the body and mind isn't always profitable to the soul. And that's, that's what he's saying here, especially going back to verse 3 there in chapter 2. He's saying that it's not profitable to the soul to always do what's pleasing to the mind and body. And indeed, much of the pleasures gained from the flesh are sin. And so in this sense, sin has never changed. And it's always been unprofitable to the soul. It's always been unprofitable. And when we, when we stop exalting ourselves and our excuses and start exalting God, we then find ourselves in the very same boat as the author of, as, of Ecclesiastes. All is vanity. When we stop exalting ourselves and our excuses. Isn't that what we do? When I think of my former life, 
using drugs, jipping school, doing all these things growing up and even into adulthood. I think about all these things and I think about why I made the choices I made and it has everything to do with making excuses for myself. Yeah, I've been through many traumas. I've been through a lot of abuse, all forms of abuse. But that's not any excuse to make the decisions I myself have been making in my life. And it never had been. And it never is moving forward, especially in Christ, knowing there is hope and there is a way out. And that way out is what we're living, but it's in the word. It's not in our excuses when we know we're going to fall short, when we decide by our own whim, by our own will, to fall short. When we, and again, when we stop doing this, we find ourselves in the same boat. Why, why am I doing this at all? Why am I making the decisions that I make? And so going back to, to John 16, 33, what we had read, what Jesus has spoken to us are the words of life. They're not meant to burden us or to cause us grief as this knowledge that the writer of Ecclesiastes is speaking of. We're told to abide in his words because he wishes us to turn away from the life choices that harm us and to allow ourselves to be as God had intended us to be. And by his sacrifice, by the sacrifice Jesus had made for us, we too will overcome the world when we submit to the will of God. Our everyday lives in Christ should be something not held in vain, should it? But something joyful and peaceful even through the dark days that we face, either in Christianity or in not. And we can keep, say, blaming God for those of us uh, in our time before we turn to Christ. We can keep blaming God for the things that go through our lives that, that aren't fair to us, the things that are terrible, these traumas and these evils that happen in the world, but we've got to remember that that's not God. That's people. We've got to remember that's not God. That's our own decisions. And so, by exalting God over our desires, we cherish truth and love. For God is love. God is truth. And instead of vanity and futility, these futile actions that we, that we partake in when we fall short, when we do evil things, when we do things that are against the will of God, and we know better because it's in our hearts, and it's been there all along. It's been there all along. So, what are we cherishing in our daily lives as we reflect on ourselves this evening? Do we cherish the futility of desire or the wonder of God in all creation? Just as we read about all the terrible and tragic things that have happened through time, we also read of the wonders and beauty of life and creation. All the heavenly decisions we make shine a light upon a darkened world. And as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 3, it says, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see what is good, or what good it is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. And just as Christ says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, it says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the, fruit, for the tree is known by its fruit. The fruits of bad trees, which may seem like they taste good for a time, are still bad fruit. The timelessness of God is salvation. And the timelessness of sin is condemnation. And so what are you going to choose? What do we choose? Salvation or condemnation? Vanity or futility? Are we choosing the wisdom of God or the wisdom of the world, which continues to fall short too? People in the world can tell us, oh, well, if you do this, it's going to feel great. If you just accept what's in your heart, even though what's in your heart everybody is saying is wrong, you'll be okay because you only have one life to live. You only have one life to live. You work so hard. That's, this is what Ecclesiastes is saying. You work so hard, so why not live it up and do whatever you want to do with what you got from all your work, from all your labors? But I ask you now, as we think about all of our labors in life, these things that we've been doing, 
or how futile are they without God? Everything we do is futile and vain if what we're doing it has nothing to do with God. But you know, the interesting thing is, by giving our lives to Jesus, by giving our lives to God, we no, longer, we no longer live in vain or futile lives, but in a life that's actually fruitful. We can actually make a difference in people's lives, and we do. We do, all of us. All of us here who are in Christ and doing what we need to do, that's what we do. Even when we fall short, it allows us a moment with God when we turn and repent, to bear, to bear good fruit out of that. And it's the one good thing you can say about the sins we've ever committed, is that something good can come from it when you turn to God. And that's something beautiful, it's something amazing, it's something wonderful. Because it is God. And it's interesting, this morning, um, Jed had, had talked of Romans chapter 6, and I, too, would like to go to Romans chapter 6. So if you don't mind reading one last section of, of Scripture with me, I'd like to go to the book of Romans chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 1. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It reads as such. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. And so I make this plea to you that you turn to God for eternal salvation and free yourself from the clutches of evil. Free, free yourself from the life you used to live. Because it is freeing. Some will tell you, especially those outside of the church, that it's just a burden. That there's nothing in the Bible that's worth believing in. And I say, no, that's not true. There's everything in the Bible that's worth believing in. And everything in the Bible isn't there to trick you, as others may say. It's there to save you. God's word will save you when you turn to him and you believe. And you believe not just with your heart, but you work forward with it. Believe by action. So take action. Please come while we stand and we sing.